Hey, I'm Mac. Welcome back to my channel. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe and consider joining my Patreon for access to new videos 12 to 24 hours early. So we have to talk about Dave Hollis again, because if he's going back into giving people advice and acting like he knows things, then I, I just got to go back to calling him out. Um, he's back to, to podcasting because I guess podcasts don't count as social media. I would counter that they do, but okay. I would also suggest that perhaps it might take longer than, let's see, eight weeks to complete the transformation or treatment process before you start coming out here and blabbing your mouth and giving people advice. But that's just me. And I couldn't help but notice his most recent episode is going to be delving more into the details about the treatment that he uh, completed. And I listened to the first couple minutes of it and I knew that someone's, someone's got to do this one. Uh, so I'm going to. Uh, it's long, so buckle in. And uh, let's go. Oh, and I haven't heard the anything past the first couple of minutes yet. So, but I'm pretty sure based on the first couple of minutes that it's definitely worth responding to. <laughs> There's no video for his podcast, as far as I know. There might be, but I I don't think there is. So that's fine. That means that I get to stay in the center of the frame the whole time. What would the world look like if we all pushed ourselves to have candid conversations with people who didn't look like us, think like us, or live like us? I'm Dave Hollis, and I'm on a mission to learn more about this world by meeting more of the people who live here. You may not always agree with everything you hear, but I guarantee you'll come away more informed on topics you might never have thought to seek out before. This isn't- I highly doubt that that is the case. Just a podcast, it's a community. And when we raise each other up, we all rise, together. Hello, Rise Together listener, Dave here. I am uh, once again on the back patio, but this time I'm not alone. I am- Careful, you're, you're dangerous out there. And also you weren't alone last time. Uh, if you'll recall, uh, some, some children were there. I think they might've been yours. I'm sitting, I mean, you're staring right into my soul, Mike. I am sitting- I've been uh, told I do that. You do do that. Uh, I am sitting with a friend. I am sitting with someone uh, that if you do not yet already know him, I hope you will come to know him because he uh, is amazing in so many ways. I, uh, I don't have a bio of you in front of you, so let me see if I can do it off the top of my head. Mike is a New York Times bestselling author, is a speaker, is a founder of a treatment facility that is extraordinary, is uh, a TV personality on a show called Dr. Phil, is uh, handsome, and works in personal development and coaching. Mr. Mike Bear, Mr. Mike Bear has uh, decided to grace us with his presence on this, the back patio of the Hollis residence, in town for nothing more than us to spend what has been just the most amazing afternoon in conversation. We did a workout together. Yeah, and I did not expect that we would be doing a podcast together. I told you I was planning on visiting you after we uh, got together at my house in Los Angeles. And uh, so here I am, I flew from Miami and kept my word. And then you said, Mike, what do you think about doing a podcast? And yeah, well, it's so we're already back to just pressuring people into doing things. Yeah, he probably wasn't ready to do a podcast because he probably was shocked to find out that you were already podcasting again. Also, uh, I'm just gonna say that that's kind of a bad idea to go to a treatment program that is run by your friend. It, it just is. You shouldn't be involving friendships in this. But what do I know? So let me even explain. So Mike has played this role in my life, not so much as America's coach. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I remember when I had my first book come out 
you had a book that was also coming out. There is this thing that happens in publishing where mm. if you are publishing from a company and someone else inside of the company is publishing, you get to know the other authors. And in the getting to know you game, if there's something in like similarity or in potential target audience, you sometimes ask someone that is also releasing a book, hey, would you consider endorsing my book? Hey, I'll send it to you, read it. If you like it, say something nice about it. I'll do the same for you. That was the way that we initially met each other. And I'll be honest, I didn't know who you were. And I was yeah. like, okay, if you publisher are telling me that he's good people, I'll take a look. And I read the book and I love the book, but I'm more than that. Um, I was, I was not aware at the time that I was being given invita an invitation to have you become a friend in my life. Mm. And it just so happened that like life would go on a lot of things happening in life between that first chance encounter and the next time that I was releasing something or you were releasing something. And we'd just kind of started to keep in touch. Right. And it was. Uh, I feel like it's relevant here that once again, all of Dave's friendships are transactional. Because when I was in town recording a podcast for the next of my books that was coming out, that I think I took what was- Built Through Courage. Built Through Courage. That I took what was at the time a bit more of a casual, intermittent texting relationship mm. to, uh, hey, after we're done recording this, can we, like friends would, just like spend some time and connect. And you came to represent for me something of a safe space in like kind of talking through whatever it was that I was working through. Mm. And there were times- Okay, so far what you're describing doesn't really sound like a friendship. It sounds like something where you're talking and he's listening and that's it. When in going through as many of the crazy things that were happening in my life that like, it was usually pretty late at night. I'd send a note like, uh, hey Mike, I'm going through this thing and I don't know why I'm thinking the things I'm thinking or processing these things in this way. And you'd send back just like the quickest, oh, well, let me, let's jump on the phone. Let's have a quick chat or you'd give me a little piece of advice. But it was when I got to hang out with you at your house after that podcast that I was like, dude, this, this guy is actually a friend of mine and I have something in a safe space and a real connection that affords me this opportunity to just be completely transparent in whatever it is that I'm going through. Dave, you sound like an AI trying to describe friendship. Also, and again, this doesn't sound like a friendship. This sounds like you go to this guy so that you can talk about yourself and just talk and talk and talk and talk. Does he get to talk? And that is a quality that um, I just admire so much in who you are, but also like I value because I want, I think everyone wants more than anything to just like have a chance to be fully and totally who they are, separate and completely away from anything that could be judged, but also with someone who in receiving all of you can see you and honor you, but also- What the fuck? Mike received all of you? Jesus Christ, Dave. So challenge you and hold you accountable. And uh, you've been that for me. So I just want to say oh, thank you. Thank to you. Start Were you that for Mike? Things off with that. But one of the things that inevitably has come up as a part of our conversation over the course of time, in part because of the work that you do, but also the work that you did years and years ago in establishing this treatment facility that I have just recently myself been a really amazing beneficiary of the work that is done there. Uh, I came to you and was like, man, I am going through it. Mm. I don't necessarily know how to understand the things that I'm feeling. I certainly don't like the way that- Well, you brought it up a few times. I brought it up a few you, times. You, 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 <clears throat> periodically, I would hear from you where I think uh, life and being in life in general, especially if you're seen as a certain expert, there can be big expectations that you have to be perfect or that you can't. Don't worry, he's not seen as an expert. I'm so tired of him, of, I'm already tired of Mike um, enabling this whole, everybody wants me to be perfect thing. Cause Dave always harps on that and it drives me crazy. No one's expecting you to be perfect. I promise you. They're just expecting you to do the minimum. At struggle, and and at different times, I know you know you were the the struggling was getting increasing for you. Yeah, and frustrating for you. It, it was it, it was increasing. It was frustrating, and in the increased weight, 
and the wildly higher degrees of frustration, I was turning to my traditional bag of coping, specifically drinking, in ways that... I'm not glad that he was drinking, but I'm just saying, I was right, I was right. How long ago did I start saying this, that he was drinking? A long time ago, a really long time ago. If only he had listened to the haters, but he didn't. He would have, he could have gotten this taken care of sooner, okay? Sooner. We're, we're even more frustrating. Like I was, uh, I was frustrated at myself for in having thought I had a handle, having previously had long periods of abstinence from drinking altogether, right. even though I'd like acknowledge the fact that, man, this is the go-to that I've had for a ton of time and I've worked on it in these ways that when in the absence of having been married or trying to put myself into new spaces, this was that thing that just kind of kept coming back. I, I reached out and was like, I don't understand. Like, I'm a smart person. Right. I understand cause and effect. I know all the tips and tricks. I get the habits and routines. And I Then what part of it do you not understand? People have certainly told you this before, before this incident, okay? Otherwise, you wouldn't be thinking about the fact that you drink so much. You, you just, it just wouldn't register. So I don't want to hear that you don't understand. I still feel myself when I go to the darkest places or I have those negative thoughts or I don't want to confront the things that I need to confront and just haven't confronted yet that grabbing a drink is still one of those things. And I remember you said it. It was just so simple. You said, well, I know how to help you. You know, I, I've done this work for about two decades worth of time. And if there's a, a thing I know more than anything, getting help is a thing that you can do, but you have to decide that getting it and whatever feelings are associated with choosing to get it have to be greater than the feelings of shame or the feelings of stigma or the feelings of whatever it is that's keeping you from taking advantage of something that sits right in front of you. And when I called you, you know. This is something that's really true when you have um, like an addict in your life uh especially a, a loved one it's it's hard for people who are in the orbit of that addict um to to come to terms with the fact that you can encourage them to seek treatment you can try to push them along into getting treatment you can let them know that if they are ready to go to treatment you are you'll help them get into it you'll help them sign up or you'll help them get there you'll transport them there or whatever help you want to offer but at the end of the day they're not going to go until they're ready to go i don't necessarily subscribe to the whole rock bottom theory i don't think i because there is no rock bottom really until you die um but i but it's just not either, even if they do end up going, if they weren't ready to go, if they weren't in the headspace they need to be in to go, then it's not gonna stick. So, you know, sometimes it's it's so hard to come to terms with it, but sometimes you just have to let them do what they're gonna do because you did what you could. Um, and that's hard for here at the beginning of the year. I was like, all right, brother, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm sick of being sick. I'm sick of being tired. Yeah. I'm tired of being tired. And, uh, it's a very, very strange thing because I am so proud of this experience that I have been through in 2022. Like mm -hmm. this is one of the greatest investments I have made in my life, in time, in, in, in anything. It is one of the greatest things I've ever been through. And yet we've talked about it. I still have a little bit of this, like, Oh, is it okay for me to talk about the greatest thing I've ever experienced? Might I be judged for? Well, it's, I, th I think for you too, and I remember you had gone a year without drinking. And for someone who can abstain for a year, it feels like they can control it. And anybody who, let's say, you know, is defined as an alcoholic, let's say we're, let's say we're using that term, right? Yep. And there's criteria that would make it so that term uh, matches the criteria that you know someone needs to be doing to to be called an alcoholic and usually the person who's the alcoholic is the last one to want to admit it and for anyone who's extremely high functioning it's even more difficult because when life looks good enough when uh, there's maybe finances are okay and family is okay it becomes that thing where it's confusing it's really confusing. Why, why can't I stop drinking even though I stopped before? And 
why is it taking control of my life? And, and, and I was really proud of you when you called me, even the few times we spoke prior, I was doing my best not to nudge you too hard. Yeah. Maybe just plant some seeds because you can't force someone to want to change. In fact, all you do is you kind of push them away. So if you can plant seeds of hope, then usually they'll come back around. Yeah. Well, what's interesting is what, so two things, what I now have, unbelievable clarity on is that there is a difference between abstinence and treatment, mm. right? Like my or abstinence and recovery, abstinence and recovery, excuse yeah. me, abstinence and recovery in that deciding to not drink for that year, right? Like I am high functioning. I can set and achieve goals. I have a long history of accomplishment and achievement. And man, a lot of my achievement is connected to how I feel like I can be loved for having mm. achieved. And there in that year was so much pride that I had for not drinking but not addressing any of the underlying things that were creating that symptom of alcohol in the first place is part of why, you know, I get, you know, it's like, it was like mid 19 to mid 20. I, you know, I very shortly after this year of not drinking run into the biggest obstacle, obstacle of my life in a divorce mm -hmm. and, and COVID and COVID. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Listen, and, I know more people that, that went back to uh, behavior of their past. That was problematic, whether it was eating, shopping, drugs there were more overdoses than ever during covid so it, it, people suffered period yeah and well so and so it's like in it and, and that brings me to the second thing i wanted to say which is like suffering is a good way to describe it in that uh i definitely in times when i was reaching for alcohol to not have to deal with the feelings that inevitably come up in hard things or, or christ the 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 convoluted sentences, those certainly are still here. Those were, those did not go away during treatment. Wow. Uh, I just wanted to interject that like, I was a very, very high functioning alcoholic. So I kind of relate to that where you kind of, even when it starts to have very clear and obvious negative effects on your life, because it has just gone so long without having a real serious impact, you sort of write off those things and you you sort of think it's, oh, well, that's it's just a one-off. That won't happen again because it's never happened to me before. <laughs> yeah, but it will happen again. Also, the reason why you had such a problem, Dave, after that year of not drinking is an effect called kindling where... Uh, it's particular to alcohol withdrawal. Um, and it has to do with the fact that each time you become physically dependent on alcohol and then withdraw from it again and have a period of abstinence, each time you do that, the withdrawal will get more and more intense. That's why or the negative self-talk or the imposter syndrome or just any of the unprocessed trauma or grief of my life, especially in the last couple of years. It was me choosing uh, suffering that I was familiar with. Like mm. I knew the predictable outcome of what would happen when I did. And as much as like I've had people in conversation with me like, oh, was drinking a problem for you? No, actually drinking was a solution for mm. me, right? It was a 95% solution that 5% of the time was a very, very bad problem. Yeah. In that it was a problem 100% of the time, just because you don't know that, because you can't visualize your organ systems that were definitely affected by it, doesn't mean that it wasn't a problem 100% of the time. And the solution was, I don't have to face the thing that I'm thinking about. I don't have to confront that trauma or that grief or that feeling or that negative self-talk. And yeah. in the muting, um, it was a, a short-term solve that was just kicking whatever that thing that I didn't want to have to confront was down the road, but with interest compounding and making whatever that thing was worse when it would present itself again. And of course, like there was something of a shame spiral because I am interested in living the very best life I can. I do want to be the best dad. I do want to be the best in relationship with any and every person, including myself. And the short-term solution of grabbing a drink created a perpetual state of suffering when it came to how I felt about myself when I was by myself and how that shame overshadowed any of the good that was already present in my life. And that was the like, this is not sustainable. This is not a thing that I can continue to do. Hmm. Uh, we got to do something different. And I know that just deciding to stop drinking isn't going to be the thing that solves it, which was where the outreach to you and the work that you've done for these last couple of decades, not just addressing substances, but right. 
the underlying behaviors, the thoughts, the beliefs, the stories, the identities, the attachments and relationships, the family of origin, all the things that we end up unpacking in these eight weeks. Well, and, and for me as, as your f friend, right? At this point, we're friends. It's also, okay, you're gonna be coming to cast centers. There's a little bit of stakes <laughs> selfishly because if this doesn't go well, the last thing I want is for you, this is your first treatment ever. And I don't want you to have a bad experience. Yeah, that's why this is a conflict of interest. That's why this is unprofessional to be treating your friend in your capacity as a as a behavioral health provider. That's why do you, like you just articulated why that's unprofessional because it's going to influence the way that you treat Dave and you're going to treat Dave differently than you treat your other patients. Shame on you. Second of all, I, I hate, I'm already hating how Dave is like, so I had all these problems. They were all in the past. Okay. I know I said they were in the past before, but now they're definitely in the past. I even wrote a book about how they were in my past, but like now they're definitely in my past because I did an eight week program. Dave, recovery is the rest of your life. And as you know, in the beginning of the process, I had to eliminate myself <laughs> and have your own team there because whenever there's someone I care about or they come to our center, like I, I'm everyone's boss. And so I have to be really mindful uh, not to play favorites or not to. Yeah, you do. And guess what? I bet you didn't succeed in doing that. You might think that you didn't play favorites, but I bet you played favorites because it's really, really hard to not do that. That's why you can't do it. It's not because other providers are just bad at not playing favorites. It's because it is a human tendency and it is very, very hard, if not impossible, to show favoritism when you have a bunch of strangers and then one person that you know. That's why. You're not special. You're not better than all the other providers, okay? It's not that they're weak and that's why we don't allow you to treat friends. It's because you. it is nearly impossible. It is not a human quality to be able to completely not play favorites. That's why you can't do it. To uh, interfere, but you know, I really believe that you needed, and, and this is my belief is people should enter into treatment, uh, hopefully syncing up or matching the lifestyle they're going to live so they can navigate the triggers in their life. Then you should have referred him to a treatment center that would be objective that matched those criteria. Why didn't you? And so by the time they get home, they're already more equipped with more tools. But I know- Yeah, well, let me tell you right now, what's going on here is the treatment that Dave got was consisting of attaching himself to you. And now he's back out in the real world. Look what he's doing, attaching himself to you, even on his podcast. When you initially came out and then you were going to come out and then you had COVID <laughs> and, then, and then I was thinking, oh, he's never coming. <laughs> if he has any excuse not to go take it. And then by that period of time, you stopped drinking. Yep. So I'm thinking, okay, he, he stopped drinking now. I don't know how much time you had. And then you're, you got COVID. And so I was like, oh, he's, the odds of him coming out here are pretty slim, but you were determined. Well, I will say this. I'd already done for me. It was the hardest thing. Mm. The hardest thing for me was if you think that, stopping drinking initially was the hardest thing. You have got another think coming. I, I, I would strongly suggest that you up the intensity of your outpatient program if you think that the initial stopping of drinking was the hardest thing because that's not the hardest thing. That's the fucking easiest thing. And I'm not saying this to be mean. I'm saying this because you need to get better for your kids. You cannot relapse. I Well, everybody can relapse, but it's really important that you are equipping yourself to be able to recover quickly and to not let it get out of control again because you have children
and they deserve better than that. So I would I would highly suggest that you prepare yourself for something that is a lot more Having difficult. The conversation with the people that I was most afraid might judge my need to go in and get help. Nobody is judging you for going and getting help. Even the haters were judging you for not getting help. That's what I was judging you for. I was yelling at you in one video for not going to get help. Who the fuck is gonna judge you for getting help? Nobody. Good for you. I think that's great that you got help. I'm just concerned that you're not taking it seriously. <sighs> Which, again, I'm gonna say this. This was one of the most unbelievable and amazing experiences of my entire life. And it is something that I could have opted to jump into and take advantage of long ago, right? Years ago, I could have decided to do this. I would have saved myself years of letting something like this interfere in any way with what is already a really great life that I have. But I didn't, I delayed because of this worry of what it might mean to have to confess that I needed to get help or um, how it might inconvenience the people that I love the most. Right. And um, number one, Dave, be honest, you were worried about how it would inconvenience yourself. You're just unable to admit that you had a flawed perception. You have to go back and edit the history to make it sound like, oh, well, I was just, I was worried about everybody else. It's okay to say like, I didn't want to go to get treatment because I would have had to explain it to my job or whatever, or because I would, this, that, and the other thing. It's okay. That's the reason that a lot of addicts don't seek treatment until something really bad happens is because, you know, it's kind of, you're going to be away for a while. You can't really, you know, if you have, if you still have your job, you can't really get time off work because what are you going to say? Everything's fine. You just want to keep the dice rolling and everything. So number one, you're not unique in that regard. And number two, you're not even being honest here. So how can you say that you have, have turned over this new honest leaf. Every person that I was worried about, you know, having to say like, hey, look, uh, I feel like I've tipped back into leaning on alcohol more than I'd like. I don't want to have alcohol a part of my life, but I also know that I've previously not drank for long periods of time and didn't deal with a bunch of stuff. And there's a place that I can go to help me deal with all this stuff right. so that I can nip this thing for good. And here we are, I'm 90 days in. We're gonna do this podcast again at like six months. We'll do it again at like a year. Like I, I do want to show like the way that this journey ends up unfolding over time because I am so new in it. But also, it was insanely inconvenient, mm. right? Like the decision to do it was really inconvenient. Like it was. Yeah, exactly. It's hard to ask. Hey, Rachel, would you mind? You know, I'm gonna come back on weekends to see the kids, but would you mind taking more responsibility with the kids? It was hard with Heidi, who as a well, what did you think Rachel was going to say? Did you think she was going to say, um, no, I, no, I can't take them. So why don't you keep, you know, drinking and, and, and watching the kids while you drink? You know, I, I would rather have your problem fester while, while our children are in your care. What it like, of course she's going to say that. What did you think she was going to be like? No, you can't go to treatment. Fuck you. Of course not. I don't know where he's getting this perception from or if this is even like something he was actually worried about. But no, of course not. People were judging you for continuing to to let a problem go unaddressed. That's what they were judging you for. They're not judging you for going to get treatment. Partner like was, of course, so supportive. By the way, Rachel's reaction was immediately so supportive of, hey, man, I'm proud of you. This is great. Go for it. Let's go. Yeah, also, let's go. But walking into treatment as Heidi and I were starting a fitness challenge together that now I'm not going to be mm. able to participate in the way that I would have hoped to be able to be supportive as a partner. That was hard. And the hardest part for me was done in having and, those conversations. Yeah, in the conversation with the kids. I, and, and sitting down and having a conversation with the kids, a thing that like, I really dreaded having a conversation. I talked to the older two boys. I didn't have a conversation um, with specifics necessarily to the younger two because I didn't know that they were in a place where they could fully comprehend all of it. But the way that that conversation with the older kids went down was one of the most beautiful experiences of my parenting life in that. Really? I got to represent to them, hey, uh, I want to go become a better version of me so that I can be a better dad to you. Dave, that's what you always say to them. You always say that garbage.
And did you actually tell them? Because I feel like your oldest ones, you know, this might be a good time to talk to them about alcohol. In fact, even a little bit earlier probably would have been a good time to talk to them about alcohol. I don't have kids. Have a discussion, though. I mean, teenagers understand what alcohol is. And I want to make sure that you know that if you run into something where help exists, Mm. that you taking action to get help is a sign of strength and not weakness. I want to normalize this as a thing that you ought to do without delay. Okay, you're worried about your teenagers comprehending something. That is, I don't... I'm 32 and I don't understand that. That that made no sense to me. That was so vague. You know, may, you know what would have been really useful probably would have been, you know, sometimes people have problems with drinking or doing drugs or whatever and if if one of you ever has, you know, if one of you ever gets in trouble with that, I want you to talk to me. Okay, it's going to be all right. You can get help. You know, I want you to just make sure you come talk to me. It's going to be okay. Something like that, you know, to encourage them to bring that problem to you rather than like their dumbass friends at school or to nobody. But that's just me. I don't see how this would have been helpful at all because I what are you like what are you talking about? Help with homework? I don't know because I didn't do this for some length of time. I was really happy that there wasn't like this, oh goodness, I'm so glad that you're finally taking care of the drinking. Like it wasn't even a thing that was on their radar. Yay for- That's what you think. They know. They know. Kids know, kids know. They understand. I remember when I was like five, like, and my dad was, uh, he. there was a get together at one of his friend's houses. And I remember like thinking like, oh, Dad's friend drinks a lot more than dad does. Like, I remember that. Like, kids notice. High-functioning drinkers. But to be able to model to them, like, we're not going to stigmatize this. I want you to ask me every single question. And hopefully, this isn't going to be a thing that you have to deal with. And also, like math, with four kids, the chances that someone's going to have to deal with something in addiction or substance is just a real possibility. And I want to be able to be, if nothing else, a model for, hey, if you need help, get help. Yeah. Now, what I will say is, <laughs> did you say those words or were you just hoping that somewhere in the vagueness they'd pluck that out? Because that makes a big difference. Sometimes you don't want to talk to something, don't want to talk to something. Sometimes you don't want to talk about something to your parents because you feel uncomfortable about it. But if your parent broaches the topic for you, it's a little bit easier to open up. That's just me thinking that. I don't know. The, the hope that you have of like replicating the real world is a thing that absolutely ends up actually happening when you're in an outpatient treatment facility like this because, yep, it's, it, it is a Monday through Friday, nine to five kind of experience. It's almost like a job. But the real world is still happening every yeah. single day. I mean, shoot, I am, it's like, it's one of these things where I, I wouldn't change a single part of how anything ended up happening, but like, the, the support that you know was represented at the beginning of me jumping into treatment was also met with an interesting commentary from my ex-wife in podcast form while I was in treatment that- a- Ooh, so there's our boy, there's, there's our bitter boy. There's our bitter boy. Listen, she doesn't owe you positive words, okay? She told you that she would watch the kids and she supported you going to get treatment. She doesn't owe you anything else. She like that doesn't mean that she's supposed to only have positive things to say about you. If you were a piece of shit, then you were a piece of shit. Okay, and you're supposed to be working to get past that, dude. And you clearly haven't that there's clearly some very real bitterness here. But she she doesn't owe she doesn't have to suddenly sing your praises just because you're going to get treatment. She can talk about whatever she wants. You knew that when you pushed to put your relationship on social media. People are interested, so I don't know what you expected. Afforded me this opportunity while surrounded by a bunch of unbelievable resources, the ability to process the feelings that come up when initial support turns into a more critical eye. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to process that mm. in the outside, being triggered the way that that kind of a thing ends up triggering you. With Seems like you still haven't processed it. Out the, the, the community of support, but I also think if I'd been completely isolated from 
the world at large, mm. I wouldn't have been in any place to even know what to do with it. Yeah, I mean, super odd timing. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> super odd. But the truth is, it's so great when it's almost a nice thing when you go through a lot of stressors while you're in treatment, because these are the things that people will go back to their old coping strategies. Um, my lisp is coming out here in Texas. <laughs> but, um, you know, like, I, I, I'm really proud of you. You know, I'm, I'm proud of you for, you know, showing up. I, you know, made, made sure to assign you the people I thought would be a really good fit. Oh, they were amazing. I mean, honestly, the most amazing and different Super people, different, right? Super different. I mean, there was... I had, so, I mean, I think I kind of explained this before, but the way that this works is that it's three different sessions each day for five days a week, eight weeks of a program. Right. Yeah. That's how intensive outpatient works, Dave. It's, it's not like unique to this. Also, did you hear how he said he made sure that Dave got the people who were the best fit for him? Is that what happened with all of your patients, Mike? Each week themed to a different thing for you to dive into and unpack. Identity was the first week. Uh, the like attachments and relationships was a week. Family of origin was a week. Fun and games like work-life balance was a week. Like everything that you have to practically consider and most of the things that tend to be connected to triggers, yep, those are the things that we end up going through. And you end up having this mix of group therapy where there's a bunch of people who are going through mm. something in either mental health or addiction and these one-on-one -on -one sessions. And I had these three unbelievable practitioners in a doctor of psychiatry who is the single person I've ever sat across from who would not let me get away with my shit. <laughs> I mean, she just, I would start giving her something that you might hear in a book or that I might've, you know, like watched a good video about in personal development lore. And she was like, are you trying to tell me what you think I want to hear? Like, I need you to tell me what you really feel. Like, like there was something so beautiful about being. Yeah, you do that all the time, Dave. We, we can tell. At least I can. I could always tell that you were just trying to say what you thought was the right answer instead of actually changing yourself. You would always say that like you learned and you learned this thing that you'd heard before and you just repeat it. And that's what you're doing right now with Mike. Because you have you don't think anything's wrong with you, do you? Challenged by this most extraordinary person. There was another one who uh, was really all about attachment and we spent most of our time talking about relationships. And there was something I think beautiful in, in like the first being about self, the other being about connection and relationship with other. And then the third person I was with was really an addiction specialist and just really like diving into, you know, like how do these things, how do these triggers, how do these feelings, how does like alcohol present as a mm. symptom to the unprocessed stuff that you have not yet tended to how can we tend to it? But then how can we also, even if you believe it to be tended, yeah. create something in routine and process to make sure it's not a thing that ever comes Well, I back. mean, I, I think, and it is ties into build through courage because it is extremely courageous to ask for help. Everyone has excuses. Everyone says, and they, uh, my whole training, what I did for years was interventions. And literally we would meet the day before we sat down with someone and spend over an hour looking at all the reasons or excuses for why they were gonna say, I'm not getting on the plane and I'm not going to treatment. And I've heard every excuse. Okay. <laughs> God, that must be nice. You know, you need treatment and people, you can, you have the option to fly on a plane for it. Cause I guess wherever you are doesn't have treatment options. So this is treatment for rich people. Also, I feel like I remember reading that like intervention, you know, Mike's the one over here saying like, oh, well you can't force people, blah, 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 blah. But you can, you know, bring a plane and ask them to get on it and have like an, a one hour intervention where you sit them down and very intensively try to persuade them. Those things don't work. They don't. Okay. I don't agree with that at all. That's bullshit. Also, how about Dave? It predictably already, Dave is now the outpatient alcohol rehab detox therapy recovery specialist now. You know, just like, and it's understandable. You know, one time back in 2016, I tore my ACL and now um, I'm a knee surgeon because I had a knee surgery. So, you know, you ready for me to operate? I've heard everything. Believe it or not, the most challenging people were actually homeless who were the busiest. And, they, and it's uh, that's a whole other, you know, uh, population that's really difficult but you why was that surprising it, you, you of course it is of course it's very time consuming 
had every reason. You have four kids. You have a relationship. You have a business. You have a uh, a brand. You know, you have uh, you have every single reason of why, and you made a decision to do what is best for your own life. You got sick and tired of being sick and. What's the implication there that maybe homeless people don't need treatment because they don't have those reasons? What the fuck? Tired, you got sick and tired of being too frustrated. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think you were telling me earlier in one of the groups, you know, they showed that 97% of people never get help. You know, we hear so much about addiction and mental health, but the majority of people never seek help. They never want it. They never want the help. Yeah. And we know people like that. What's crazy too is- Citation needed is like my reluctance was connected to ego and vanity and the stigma that might be attached. And the headline ends up being kind of twofold. Number one, you can call my thing alcohol and I can call your thing compulsive eating or workaholism or whatever. We all got things. We I feel like I feel super comfortable in acknowledging that uh, I got a thing, you got a thing, we all got a thing. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't feel comfortable with you talking about my thing, Dave. I don't. See? Dave's the addiction specialist now because he completed an eight-week program of treatment. So the idea that I might make precious my thing or put my thing on a pedestal, like somehow I'm special for having a thing, uh, is, again, like it's vanity and ego. But that separately... The idea that I might hold back on getting help because of the worry of what people might say about my decision to make my life better. Hmm. <sighs> no, literally nobody, literally not a single person has ever, ever had judgment for you or any negative, any negative feedback for you of any kind for your decision to make your life better. I guarantee that's true. They had maybe a judgment for you for waiting for so long, for denying it for so long, but not a single person had a single problem with you making a decision to make your life better by going to treatment. Why would anyone have a fucking problem with that? Nobody would. That doesn't make any sense, Dave. Stop acting like all your problems are in your past and like you know all the answers now because you completed an eight week program. Are you fucking kidding me? It hasn't been that long, Dave. And even if it had been longer, that doesn't make you an expert. It makes you a person who hears self-help shit and regurgitates it. That's all you're doing. And that's what you're doing with this program. And it's kind of bullshit because you should be taking this more seriously than you are. And you shouldn't be teaching other people this material because you are not qualified. I mean, just think about it for a second, because this is one of those things that like doesn't connect in the moment when you're convincing yourself that you shouldn't go and get help. If someone wants to take a swipe at me for doing something that fundamentally will change the rest of my life. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody. Who wants to do that? I wouldn't want to do that. I was the one who was criticizing you for not admitting what was going on. So if even the most vile of haters who made you feel bad was only criticizing you for not doing this, then who is going to criticize you for it? Because the fact that you had not done asshole. this... The fact, there, that, the fact that you had not done this yet was why I was criticizing you so viciously. That was like the biggest problem that I had with you. Just, there's just no other way to put it. If someone wants to come at someone for taking a step to become a better dad, to become a better partner, to become a better person who can have a fundamentally different relationship with themselves, that's a them problem, not a you problem. And, I, and we had this full circle moment today because I was even like in debate as to whether or not, like, should we, like, is it okay to have a conversation about this? Is it weird, not weird? And it was a God moment kind of thing. Like within 10 minutes of the conversation, I got an email, a text from someone who is a part of my friend community that I was really honest with very early on. Like I'm like maybe two weeks in and had not yet gone into treatment that like, hey, I'm heading into treatment. I'm gonna, you know, I'm two weeks into not drinking. I'm not drinking anymore. And for them, it was permission to acknowledge the thing that they also have been struggling with. And I got the text today that, you know, here I am about 
90 days in and they're just crossing the 60 day threshold of their own sobriety journey. And I was like, no, we have to have this conversation because even if there's something that ends up coming up for someone wanting to poke at it or whatever, maybe there's someone who hears this today and is like, well, maybe this is the sign I've been looking, you're looking for a sign. Maybe this is your sign that you also are tired of being tired and help is a thing that you've long known in your gut was a possibility, but you're afraid of doing it. I've just come out of the most extraordinary life experience, period. Mm. And I want to encourage somebody who uh, is struggling, whatever you're struggling with, there is someone that exists to help, whether it's in conventional treatment or otherwise. And the worry of what people might think is nothing compared to the way that you'll feel in taking a step into getting the help that sits there begging you to step toward it. And, and, and that's such a great point. And when the help is offered, it's important to remember that sometimes the greatest change happens when it's things we don't want to do. <laughs> yeah. we, all, we wish we could just take a pill. We wish we could just solve it right away. And people try. Not only did you ask for help, but you followed through with all suggestions. And, you know, it's been great to see how much more peace and how you've had moments of what we call the pink cloud, <laughs> yes. which is the when you start feeling alive again and your lights start turning on and you start feeling. Dave, you're still in the pink cloud or Mike, Dave is still in the pink cloud. This, what we're hearing, is the pink cloud. And even more spiritual, and it's just really been great to see you do it, that. It's unreal, and I, I mean, I'll say this, like. I feel like Mike didn't really explain the pink cloud very well there. The pink cloud is that initial um, aura of kind of joy and confidence and feeling like nothing, nothing is ever going to go wrong again that that you that you frequently get when you first get sober or get clean from drugs it it feels like everything is so great and like you're you're never going to struggle with this again and it's important to be aware of the pink cloud because things are going to get a lot harder i i was committed from the moment i decided to go so my my tr you know recovery my my treatments it began before i got there mm. And it was, it was marked at the beginning by nervousness. Like I did not know what to expect. Mm. It didn't matter how many times you told me how good it was going to be for me. I was, um, I was terrified mm. of um, what it would mean to confront what I knew would be needed to confront to get to a place where I felt like I could find peace or could, could not uh, you know, have some of the darker thoughts or the darkness that had existed present in my life. Mm. The person that I was at the, in those first two weeks was fundamentally different than the person I was in weeks, call it three through six, yeah. was fundamentally different from the person I was week six through eight. Mm. There is something surreal, odd. I, I'm gonna cry about it because it's just like, I, 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 I think like anyone, I walked in thinking I understood a lot of things I didn't understand. Mm. There was, I think, even, you know, like a degree of hubris in some of what was being taught. I can remember. I Why do I feel, it, uh... You just know he was in there being like, oh, well, I know everything about, you know, I'm a, I'm a published author, so I know all of this already. So that's why I don't have a problem. And that's why I'm here because I know everything that you are teaching us. And let me just talk all the time because I realize that if I raise my hand, then I get to hear my own voice more because I'm very, very smart. That's probably what he did gross and then and not surprising like it, it he, he is fundamentally just unable to make himself not the center of attention or make himself not the smartest person in the in the room dave sometimes other people are having something going on and, and maybe this just maybe this is just your background part right now I sent you a text on not like the day first one. day was it day one day one god i shouldn't you have done it day one it oh my god no, no. it's embarrassing <laughs> <laughs> go ahead read it i don't but, but like i basically sent my i bet that text was nasty like this text of like mike like we're talking about identity like i wrote a i wrote a chapter in my book about identity like i know identity like i came in like i think probably most people who are raising their hand for help like i don't really need that much help or I want, or people go, I want this kind of help, but I don't, I'm not a group. A lot of people go, I'm not a group person. Yeah. And then the first two days, but then by the end, oh you my God. love the people in the group. The, the group, the group experience. Well, I, let me just stay on, let me just stay on this track for two seconds. I don't talk about group, but 
there was something so unbelievably humbling about the decision to um, to just kind of do every single thing that was asked, even if you didn't understand it, or even at times thought that it was crazy that you were being asked to do it. Mm. Because there is, as it turns out, of course, a method to the madness. And for someone who, you know, in some ways was living, like I was willing to be self-aware enough to acknowledge that there was a problem, but also in denial about how to fix it. Mm. And here I was surrounded by experts who have decades of experience knowing exactly how to give the best chance to anyone if they were to just follow the way that they know works best. And that like, that like, I think I'm, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I understand too much of personal development or maybe I've been doing that melted away. Yeah. I just, I understand too much about personal development. That's why I had a problem that required me to go into some place to work on myself because I understand it too well. See, it's not that I don't know things. It's that I know too many things. See, here's the thing, Dave. You might have realized that you were wrong about how you were behaving at the beginning of treatment, but I guarantee you the problem is that going forward, you're not going to then apply that learning and approach situations thinking, okay, let's not rush to judgment. Let's not assume that I know more than the person who's teaching me knows. Let's not assume that I've learned everything there is to learn. Let's, let's be humble in how much we think we know. You're not going to. And then you're just going to repeat this over and over going, oh, I didn't know there was something to this. Do, do. That's how stupid you sound. And the version of who I was in those first two weeks became instead of like talking the most in the groups, or I even hate to admit it, but like I was peacocking a little bit, like guys, I know we're all the same here, but I know a few things. So let me, <laughs> let me share. The- I'm a fucking wizard. I'm a fucking psychic. T-shirt. Let me share as though I'm a, a, a an associate. I'm a co-facilitator. My name's Dave. I know that I'm a, a patient here, but I, by the end will be an instructor, you know, like I'm embarrassed a little bit for that dude because by the- And yet here you are acting like an instructor again. It's just you're fundamentally unable to see what you're fucking up in the moment. Fundamentally unable. The third week, I mean, I went through a four week period where I think I cried more than I talked mm. because- Dave, you do that all the time. Every single bit of what had not been tended to when I went through the abstinence window, um, it all was now bare and exposed and was, um, and, and like in tilling the ground, like you can't plant the seeds until you till the ground. And like, when you start tilling the ground, you find all these old roots. See, there you go. Repeating what you think Mike wants to hear again. And mm. rocks and, and like staring at them completely naked and exposed. I was, I was just like, okay, I'm glad that there are still six more weeks. I'm glad that there are still five more weeks. I remember getting there. I was like, what could we possibly talk about for eight weeks? <laughs> What, like, I have never done anything. Dave, you don't need anything to talk about to talk for eight weeks. For eight weeks, I've never done anything for eight hours, I don't even think. Like eight weeks of time felt like an eternity. And those first two weeks, I had that attitude of like, what could we possibly need to do for eight weeks worth of time? And now I understand like there's, there's a breaking down to the core that has to happen before you can rebuild anything. And... The most important thing for me was um, the time was there to normalize being uncomfortable and not changing anything. Mm. Like just being uncomfortable. Dave, do you realize that you've said this all before the treatment program? You've said that you were getting comfortable with being uncomfortable and blah, 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 blah. So what's different now? Comfortable with the stories I was telling, being being uncomfortable with sometimes the things that were happening outside of treatment Mm. that were super triggering and just sitting with it over and over and over to normalize sitting with it so that when I get out of treatment and have a 10 minute episode of being triggered, I can remind myself that I just sat through eight weeks worth of being triggered and was able to be just fine. Thank you very much. It wasn't comfortable. It wasn't nice. I didn't love it necessarily, but I was stronger for having survived it and proud of myself for not having reached for alcohol to mute the uncomfortable feelings. Let's go. So it was, it was a beautiful, let's go. I mean, um, by the end, those last, those last two weeks, the, the anxiety or or worry of what it was going to be had become, um, 
a worry of how it would feel to not be inside of a space that I was able to fully and completely every single day be honest, just completely bare, honest. This is who I am. This is what I struggle with. Honest. And in that room, whether it was in the one-on-ones or in the groups, have every single person be like, me too. I feel, you know, that reminds me of like, there was not an ounce of judgment. And in a world that's so filled with it, mm. that was like, that was the medicine. That was the thing that was just so beautiful in that, in that space, because it just is an invitation to come as you are. And man, like. So are you saying that you're planning on going back to being a lying sack of shit now? Because that's what got you into this mess in the first place. So I would suggest that you carry over that honesty. Now I get to, and that's, if there was a thing that like I am attempting to maintain out of treatment, Mm. it's the, man, remember how good it felt when you just got to be who you were, right? Imperfect, work in progress, Mm. lots. You've been doing, you've always said that about yourself. So what's different now? You, you, You say this now, but you said this before all the time you constantly said it you constantly said it even while you were in the throes of peak alcohol withdrawal on the patio of peace okay so do you think that you haven't said this before because you have you need to stop treating this like it's something you're an expert in now because going through a treatment program does not make you an expert and i assure you things are only going to get much harder from here it's a good and also some stuff that you're still trying to figure out and work on like be that guy every single day and if that doesn't attract certain people or repels them or if someone rejects you because of they're not supposed to be here yeah and usually the people who want to pick apart or reject they're I don't know. There, it's it's kind of it's it's not even the energy of getting well, healing, getting better. It's it's the judgment police. It's the thought police. But the majority of people, we all know people who are alcoholics. You know, I'm in recovery. Everyone knows someone in recovery. We all struggle. We all have ups and downs. It's especially in the world of social media and digital media. You know, it's the great thing is it kind of being in treatment reminds us of like our humanity our truth the honesty and look you have a whole recovery plan since you've been back here in texas yeah you know we just went to a mean this evening you go to means you know it's it's not like you're viewing this as you know i went off to treatment i'm cured <laughs> at all go back to- really because that's how he's talking texas <laughs> i'm good to go at all yeah <laughs> no this is a the cool thing is um in a world again where i stig- stigmatized recovery myself like I thought, what are you talking about? It was a thing. I like, we just had an experience tonight where I walk out and I'm floating. Mm-hmm. It was just like, we both were what me too. What an awesome night. What yeah. an awesome. That's the pink cloud. Awesome night. And this is a thing that again, it's like, I've judged something I've never experienced. I've judged people I've never sat next to. Yeah. I've judged things that I didn't appreciate. Like, the, the antidote to so much of my unhappiness was always freely and readily available, but I'd convinced myself that it was going to paint me with some kind of brush and that vanity as a barrier to entry mm. was so ridiculous when I now get a sense of like what it means to walk into a space and be welcome just as I am. And so, oh, so you're the one who is judging. Okay. See, Dave, that's. That's a you thing. Other people don't judge for that. No, hey, I'm going to walk out of here and I'm going to be floating for the experience of community in a way that I wouldn't have otherwise experienced yeah. if not for owning who I am and being, and being prouder than I've ever been of who I am and, mm-hmm. and trying to show up for myself, acknowledging all the parts of me, every part, the parts that, are, um, that have always been there, but that, were, um, that in denying them was keeping me from some of that light. You know what I mean? Does he realize that he's saying the exact things, the exact words and phrases that he said the last time he was on the patio of peace. I mean, the group thing I want to come back to, because this is also one of those things that if you've never experienced group therapy and you ever find yourself walking into it, uh, you will be like most humans and be skeptical of what the (laughs) heck is actually happening here. And the craziest Dave, your experiences aren't that unique. I'm just telling you that they aren't. 
thing happens in a setting like this, you form bonds in ways that you will never, ever form bonds with people because of frequency, the depth of what you are diving into, and the connection that comes in honesty, just like pure and total honesty. You know, I think everyone has a deep desire to be seen for who they are and loved exactly as they are. And that's the kind of thing that ends up happening inside of group. The, I mean, like it is a ragged Dave, you can, you can be honest with people in everyday life. You, you just start off by being honest. Tag mishmash of people yeah. and they are my <laughs> people. I have like, I have stayed in contact with so many of the crew and I'll get a random text on a day. Just like, Hey man, thinking of you, what's going on. And it's just like, Oh my goodness. You know, like I, I just, I feel connected to this crew who were present for one of the most significant experiences of my life. And I will. Yeah. All of this is going to fade. The euphoria from going to meetings is going to fade. So I would highly suggest that you have a strong, you know, mental toolbox built up for when that happens because it doesn't sound like you have, because you are repeating the exact things that you have said time and time and time again for like the past two years. For like the past two years, you've been repeating yourself over and over and over. You wanna be the best version of yourself. You are stepping into being comfortable with being uncomfortable. You are, just trying to make a decision to make your life better. You are, you're trying to become who you were meant to be. You just want to authentically be who you are. You want to form connections, blah, 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 blah. You're not saying anything new, Dave. You've said this all before. What's different? Would have, if I had a choice, asked to not have to be in group when I came in. <laughs> no, no idea. Yeah, sure. That was, I was, wor to be honest, I was worried for a few things. One was my relationship to you. And I don't, you're, I don't want this to go bad. <laughs> of like, no, I mean, that's the selfish, right? Yeah. But I had a feeling it was going to go good because I just being around you and you're like, and I didn't want you to go in a direction where you go off somewhere. There's no contact. You're in lockdown. You go back home. There's no transition. It's not real life. And it's just not, it's really, it's defeating. Yeah. It's a defeating experience. And um, the other was when you see the mishmash, and when you get into the curriculum for you not to quickly go, oh, what am I doing here? Yeah. And yeah. what am I going to get out of this? And you know what I mean? I like, know, of course, what you mean. Here's the interesting thing. We were all in a group text uh, several times a day. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had to step out a little bit, like I had mentioned to you, because I thought, okay, I want to keep a relationship with Dave as, his friend, as your friend, and I need to not get involved in the details. Because I was like wanting to make sure you did it because a lot of people won't tolerate and they'll start dictating their recovery plan. Yeah. And that's right when it goes south for them. Yeah. Well, and so do you do this for all of your patients or just Dave? What's interesting is I think there is just something natural as a part of our human condition to, to judge a little like book by cover, but then also when you become aware of just how suffering is so universal, mm. When you hear the depths of someone suffering, your first reaction is, oh, I am not like this person because they are really going through it. And there were some people. Don't project, Dave. That's what you think. Really, God, going through it. And so um, that initial reaction is very quickly melted by this appreciation that we are all the same. Mm. We are all struggling. We no, we're not. We are all human. We are all battling demons. We are all dealing with stuff from our childhood or dealing with rejection or dealing with self doubt or, or dealing issues, or whatever. avoiding issues or muting things. all of us, every single one of us. Yeah. And so the like initial reaction to, and this is, again, I think it's ego or vanity. It's like, well, I'm not like these guys. Like I, I might have problems. But I don't have these kind of problems was very quickly changed into, I'm so glad I found people that make me feel so normal for being who I am. Mm. And that is just such a gift. I feel like I was given a front row seat to human to humanity, to, to everyone. And so I think like one of the gifts, and it wasn't even in the brochure is like, you walk away with compassion. You walk away with empathy. You walk away appreciating that you have no concept what anyone that you are interacting with on any given day is actually going through mm -hmm. because every single person you deal with is going through something. 
And the way that you are able to maybe in, a, in an experience like this, walk away and be like, oh my goodness, I have a completely new worldview. That person who's being hateful, that person who's having a, a, a bad day and taking it out on me, I was thinking that they were just being mean or they're a jerk, but no, they're, they're in pain. They're struggling, they're suffering. And man, I was suffering too. I, I have compassion or I have empathy for the fact that they're going through what they're going through. Well, it's and, a and the, thing. the interesting thing is one day you can feel, oh man, I'm not suffering like this. And another day you're like, I'm suffering more than anyone here. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, I All mean, of a sudden, yeah. it's a roller coaster. I'll tell you what, there were there were a handful of times where, you know, the first meeting of every day is what they call a process meeting, where it's just open to the room. You're processing whatever you individually are going through on that day. Some people are processing frustration with traffic. Oh, how nice for you that your biggest weight in life right now is traffic. And other people are processing really deep trauma. I, I hit a window there in the middle where that process meeting for me, I, I started the conversation almost every time with, hey guys, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go into this again, but, and then I started crying. And I just started talking about some of the stuff that I was trying to work through and unprocessed trauma and some relationship attachment stuff and grief from divorce that I was uncomposed in delivering. Like I am good at speaking. I was not good at speaking in that because it was coming up, it was coming out. And that process was doing as it states, allowing me to process in a way that I never ever had before. But it was it was happening in part because the bond that now existed with these strangers who'd become friends mm. had said, you're safe here, brother, just right. come on in and let it out. And as soon as you'd say like, I'm sorry to bring it up, everyone in the room was like, don't be sorry, man. This is why we're here. We're here and you can bring this up as many days as it takes for it to not come up. How did you, th yeah, that's how group therapy works. I don't know what you thought it was going to be. I didn't know if you thought it was going to be like, yeah, stop fucking talking about it. it. God, it's so annoying listening to him talk almost like he discovered this. Like it's all new. No one's ever done this before. And like, thank God Dave is here to teach us all about his experiences. You have such bad main character syndrome, Dave. And, you know, there was a Cal Ripken-esque consecutive days of crying streak that I, you know, I, at first I felt bad about. And then I realized like, oh, this is, this is why I'm here. This is why I'm here. And it felt so. You really need to work on this whole extrinsic validation thing. So good. It just like, it felt so good on the, on the, like on, at, towards the end. It didn't, I'll be honest. It didn't feel good in the middle. Yeah. It was hard. It was really hard. There were a string of like four weeks there where I was like, oh my goodness, this is really, really hard. And it was supposed to be. But, you know, that was, I think part of the beauty was like the willingness to, to sit in that hard and be in that hard and keep coming back, even though, you know, you, you finish a day at five. And for me, because I was trying to replicate something of a isolated experience, I was going back to a studio apartment that I'd rented in Airbnb and I'd sit for what would be then six or seven more hours being kind of upset, be, you know. Jesus Christ. Uh, must that must be nice. You 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 can afford treatment, you can afford a nice apartment in Los Angeles where I used to live and it was a fucking $2000 for a studio. Processing the emotions. I was in my thoughts and you know whether it was journaling or just sitting there working through it and uh you know, the idea of then waking up the next day and coming back in and having to get, go through it all again wasn't always a thing that I was looking forward to, but trudging through it is, you know, like the only way out is through, man. Like that, the only way out was through and we like, we worked through it for sure. Yeah, all the hard parts are done now. In closing, uh, or before we close, I, I, I am interested just in like something that might be practical or tactical for the person who's listening and is like, wow, you're making this not sound like medicine as much as it might be an opportunity for freedom and a really you know, like uh, uh, awesome way to transition away from suffering into something that is more like freedom. If, if they find whoever they are, the listener finds themselves right now still confronting the stigma or still like afraid of asking for help. What's the first piece of advice that you give to somebody? Well, you can always call us the cast centers because Robert will talk to anyone. Yeah, he will. So even if you're looking for a therapist in your hometown or just needs a voice to talk to, that is Robert's job. So for one, there's no excuse. It's free advice, free conversation with Robert at Cast Center. So, you know, it's castcenters.com. You call, you'll speak to Robert. And if Robert's not available, eventually he'll be available. You'll speak to Robert and he will spend all the time that's needed. I, I, I mean, look, asking for help, know who you're going to when you're asking for help. It's really important. You know, for example, if I, if I need, if I was really struggling, I wouldn't go to my mom. My mom's alive. I love my mom dearly, but that's not who I'm going to go to today. Yeah. 
okay? And sometimes we go to certain people over and over again, and it's not the right people. Or sometimes we make excuses for why we can't take care of our anxiety or depression. We'll be like, well, that's because I went through this in life, or that's because of the divorce, or that's because if you were me, you got to eliminate that and just realize you can feel better. There's always a window to walk through and just ask the right people. And, and by the way, you may go to a therapist. Some people go, therapy doesn't work for me. I've met, worked with plenty of therapy doesn't work for me. I'll be like, well, how many therapists have you been to? I went to one. It didn't work for me. I'm like, well, how many teachers did you have in school? <laughs> like you maybe didn't like your math teacher, but you loved your English teacher. Yep. It's you have to keep doing it. Like there's this idea that suddenly in mental health, you try something once or twice and that's just it. And so just, you can't give up the, the journey. Yeah. I will say, and I, I want to attribute this quote. It was at Einstein. Somebody said this, like you want a different result. You got to do a different thing. I, that's not even the quote, but like, I, <laughs> I like it. W- but, but the idea, like I wanted a different result, right? Right. Like I wanted to not be anchored by all of the things that I had not processed. I wanted to not have alcohol as uh, a thing that I might lean on to not have to confront the way that I was feeling about myself. Yeah. And I was doing the same things that I always had done and expecting something of a different result, Mm -hmm. which is the definition of insanity. Yeah. And that's not the definition of insanity. Stop repeating it. So making a decision to do something completely different, completely inconvenient, completely hard, completely like it just uh, my entire life had to be put on pause was the attempt to get a different result. And here's the thing. I am so new into this. I've never been so proud of myself in my entire life. Mm. Number one, I, I'm goodness. I've never been so proud of myself in my entire life. I never have. And I am just starting a journey that will last for the rest of my life. This is not like, Oh, I went. And- I'm glad he understands that. Although I'm not sure he quite understands it. If he thinks he's already gotten through the hardest part. And so I'm done. It's great. This is now me committing to recovery and the work that mm. started by doing something different for the rest of my life. And part of why I wanna do a follow-up to this podcast is to talk about, you know, well, what happens when you come out of the cloud, as it were, when you're flying high, feeling, <laughs> like literally yeah. feeling. Okay, I'm glad that, I'm glad he's, I'm glad he's gotten this, um, this piece of it, because I was getting a little concerned there. But I'm still not sure that he completely gets it for the first time. Like I am feeling all the feelings for the first time. Um, you know, here's the news flash. I hate to like let everyone in. I said this to you at dinner, you know, you, you go through this work and you confront all these things and you make this commitment and get the tools and the resources to stop doing the thing that you were doing to cope. And it doesn't make your problems go away. Mm. Like my problems are still here. I'm just equipped because of this experience to handle them in productive ways that make them either not feel as big as I'd previously made them out to be because of the work that was done to deconstruct some of the stories I was telling around them or my willingness to represent that, oh, I know I need help. Mm. And I'm going to continue to put myself in environments that will allow me to lean on that help on the days when I'm not strong enough to do it on my own. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I think for sure came out of this in so many of the like aha moments, like the decision to step away from social and the, the, the want to really focus on me. Yeah, because social media, I don't know anyone that got sober through social media. No one, I, I can guarantee you. <laughs> I mean, like, it does the opposite. I can guarantee yeah. you. Um, but when I came out, when I came out of, uh, when I came back from LA and I get back in Texas mm-hmm. and I'm putting together like, well, what's kind of like, what, what's the plan of attack? Like what's next for me? There were only a few things that I have 100% certainty on what next needed to absolutely 100% always have as a part of my routine in my life. You know, continuing support was certainly one of those things. Uh, focusing every single bit of my energy into the thing I know I can do well, and that is being a very present, intentional father to these four children. Mm. And this this thing that, man, is happening in real time, a very deliberate and intentional interest in spending time in connection with people in person. Yeah. A thing that I think was exacerbated, certainly by COVID, but that also in like the the faux connection. And I say that in a way that hopefully doesn't dismiss at all how nice and wonderful it has always been to have a community of people online. But there is something that happens in person that is different than what happens on the internet. And so like the thing that we're doing tonight Mm. has been the most important, one of the most important things in that you're the eighth person that I have made dinner for that isn't related to me at this house Mm. in the last two and a half weeks. I am flying tomorrow to have dinner. I like, I have no agenda outside of, I would like to come to you to have dinner with people. That must be nice. 
people that I am friends with, but that live out of state in my buddy, John Acuff and Annie Downs, mm. maybe Carlos Whitaker is going to show up. I don't know. But like the, the standing friend meetings that I have with the people in my community are the things that I am prioritizing because I appreciate that some of what was missing in my life was the authentic connection that comes in being present in real life and in person. And the only way that I'm going to maintain the feeling that I have is by not thinking I can do any of this alone and developing and, and really pour, like, like watering the grass in these areas that are so important to me. I, I, <laughs> I, was, uh, I was with my kids for eight days in a row, not long after I got back for what was their spring break. And having your kids tell you that they're proud of you <laughs> is uh, a thing I hope every person alive gets to hear. Mm. The critic in me, I will be honest, like started speaking first, like, oh man, if they're proud of you for how intentionally you're showing up, it must've been that you meant that you weren't showing up that well. And very quickly I was like, just. Wow, you have some neurosis there that you need to address as well. Be in today, yeah. be present in how good you feel about how you're doing and how well you're pouring into them. And don't let. Ew, don't, ew. That asshole voice that keeps trying to convince you that you're not good enough or you're, you didn't do it good enough or that regret or, or whatever repeating yourself over and over and over and over for years let it go yeah be where you are and continue to to pour into these spaces because this is the only place you're ever going to be my man it's uh it's been amazing and i credit um i mean shoot i credit our friendship the seeds that were planted that allowed me in those moments where i was like why do i why did i why did i do this man like why, i know that drinking isn't going to be a thing that's going to help me but i found myself tonight reaching for a drink and i don't want to do that and you being there to consistently help nudge even if you weren't doing a, a full court nudge man <laughs> you gave me a nudge Good. um the role that heidi played i just i want to give her credit for being someone who so consistently was witness to like all of who i am but also was like Take care of this. Yeah. Take care of this. You are strong enough to face the things that you need to face, and um, and with her support and encouragement, like you my. I remember jumping on the phone with both of you, and she was just all. She was all in. Yeah. She was all in, and her 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 being all in in a in a crazy way where I was so scared of what it might mean to confront, um, was was an unbelievable gift and a permission slip in some ways to go do something that was terrifying and turned out to be beautiful. So uh, I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful certainly for her, uh, and I'm grateful for all of you all of you in this community that have been so consistently supportive in the midst of, man, the craziest few years of my life. And uh, I'm excited for every single thing that is about to come. What that's going to be, I don't know, but I know it's going to be good in part because of a willingness to get help. So uh, thank you, Mike, for being here. Mike, Thanks, if, Dave. if someone wants to learn more about you, learn more about cast, learn more about anything that you are up to next, where do you, uh, where would you send well, people? No, I mean, I, I honestly, they can just, if anyone's curious about getting help for f like free advice, call castcenters.com. Uh, my socials is coach Mike bear, but this is really about you, Dave. I'm, I'm here for you. That's why I flew in. I told you I'm flying in. I said, I'm going to fly in in a few weeks and see you and check in and see how you're doing. So I kept my word. You did. You gave me a window of time. I'm staying the night tonight. I'll fly out in the morning and I love you. I love you too, man. All right. Between now and next week, I hope you all feel permission to be exactly who you are own the parts that you don't necessarily love the most. And if any of those need help, I hope you have the courage to turn some of that shame into power and take a step by asking for help. We'll see you next week on the Rise Together podcast. Rise Together is hosted by me, Dave Hollis. This show is edited by Andrew Weller with production support. By Must be so nice being able to just fly to your out of state friends to have dinner. There are some friends that I have that live out of state that what I wouldn't give to be able to just fly to have dinner with them, money being no object. Jesus Christ, Dave, you're disgusting. I'm really happy that he has gotten help, that he's feeling good right now. Um, however, I have a couple of concerns. Number one, it doesn't seem like he has changed very much. He might think he has, but he's saying the same things that he's always said. So it doesn't seem like anything has actually stuck. And it doesn't seem like he's ready for that piece of it that is going to be the rest of his life. It seems like he is in the pink cloud and self-aware of it, but it, it just, it doesn't seem to me 
like he has built up the um the support system that he's going to need going forward uh, but i hope i really hope that he has and i hope that he is able to stay sober because it's really important and he needs to um he might not be ready to admit that he needs to he might think that he won't you know end up getting arrested or you know ending up dead from it but that's where it was headed it was pretty serious there and number two i also hope that he can see that he's doing the whole being an unqualified teacher thing again that you always see in personal development where they go through a problem and then they immediately after doing the bare minimum for fixing the problem are like oh well that's all in my past i fixed it and now i'm ready to teach you how to fix it and it's like no you're not ready actually because you're not qualified because you've just done the first step okay so why don't you go back to you know sit down dave have a seat shut up okay you don't have to teach about everything i i don't know how these people think that they can just assume that they know everything just because they've gone through the very initial part of a treatment plan but it's ridiculous and that's why i'm here to talk about it all right everybody i've been mac peace out bye